Well, well it's, uh, it's all well and good as standing up here telling you kind of the art of the possible, etc. And But with the case study, it's always good to hear from an actual current customer to make sure that we're not lying in terms of what we do and the results that we can achieve. But So this is Matt. I'll let Matt introduce himself. Hope this is working. Yeah, uh, Matt Doyle from Play and Go. Um, you won't have heard the, the company, guaranteed it, because before I started, I hadn't either. Um, so essentially what we do is we provide, we create games. We're a creative organization which creates games for um, niche, the slot casino industry. Bear with me. It feels niche, but there's, there's a lot of money in it, which is good. Um, so we, are, we kind of feed, uh, like I say, the slot casino industry. Um, but it's, it's a purely creative company, loads of art, artists, developers. Um, we operate out of uh, seven countries uh, globally. Um, headquartered in Malta, where obviously the gaming industry is quite quite prevalent, um, and the tax is low. So we are relatively small compared to some of the organisations. Um, we're about 750 employees, uh, like I say, spread across seven countries, and trying to break into the US as we speak. Um, so yeah, we the revenue targets are pretty good for the size of the organisation. So I was able to work out the figure earlier. Um, we haven't done it yet, but now and now I've done it. And I've realised we can save uh, 13 million quid, which I've just worked out. I'm going to have that conversation later. So, Big um, bonus. Yeah, yeah. Hope, well, if we were bonus culture, but unfortunately we're not for some reason. Uh, yeah, so that's Matt. So I'm going to ask him a couple of questions in terms of like, about his journey, in terms of what it's, how he got started, etc. But if you've got any questions, uh, please, please feel free to put your hands up. But to kick us off, so as with everyone, Matt, everyone's got a million of things to do. What was kind of the impetus for you to get started? It was quite interesting. A lot of the things that were noted there, which would be the standard things, probably weren't the main reason. Uh, the main reason was um, professionalising the way we do things. So the company is about 25 years old, but has only grown to what it's in its more current format and literally doubled in size over the past three or four years. Um, so it was just a case of we had everyone getting whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted it. And that's because it was, we have a, the CEO is also the owner. So it was a very kind of, you know, family kind of orientated way of working. If someone said, I need this person, they had that person. If someone said, we all want to fly here for a party, they flew there for a party. And genuinely, that, that did happen. The whole company would fly to Malta once a year for a party. Um, so it was about professionalising the way we do things. And interestingly, Danny's sales pitch, which we think, you know, we said before, is kind of an anti-sales pitch at times, is if you haven't done, if you haven't tried this on a spreadsheet, then try it on the spreadsheet and then come to us. And that's what we were doing. And then that justification becomes a whole lot easier when you realise the spreadsheet scenario is really difficult. You've got about seven, eight different spreadsheets from all the different business areas, pulling them all together. You invariably drop things, things get missed. And then by the time it's started, it's wrong. Because I'm wondering, oh, I forgot this, I forgot that. And then they're just adding more and more and more because there's no commitment to a cycle of any kind. It's just literally, as and when you want, just chuck it all in. So it was more about professionalising that process because we're in that stage as a company of growing into a much more professional organisation. Uh, so that was the primary driver. Then on the back of it, obviously all the key things that I mentioned there as well. Cool. Um, so linking into that, so obviously you've got that problem. How did you convince kind of your boss who you report into, the CPO, to think, look, this is a, a problem that I or we need to solve? Well, interestingly, he joined probably about six months before I did. And he started the process of trying to professionalise it because he was kind of given the task of basically bring us to where we need to be. Because great CEO, great CMO, brilliant at producing games, brilliant at selling games, but it was all the underlying stuff that just wasn't quite right. So he was given a bigger task than probably the CPO should have, which is, like I say, trying to professionalise things. So he'd started it, and I came on board, and we kind of saw it just wasn't working. So the convincing was the fact that he'd actually done a lot of him himself outside of his remit and realised this isn't working, this is too difficult. And like we say, it started off as a wish list. And then you go to the level above the managers, we were just talking about it here, the certain level of managers, yep, yeah, that's what I want. You go to the level above and they all go, no, 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 that's not gonna happen. They're all just wanting it to make their lives easier. We don't need it. And then they refine it down to a number. You think that's the number for the year. And then the end of the year you've hired double. Just because that, and that genuinely happened just because there's no structure to it, there's no organisation. So it needed to be taken to that next level of professionalism. Um, so the convincing genuinely wasn't hard. It, it probably took me about two or three questions of, can we look at this, can we look at that? 
until he actually said, he genuinely said, have you got a vested interest in this or something? <laughs> he generally thought I was a partner of some kind. But then we got, Dan, Danny came along and did his magic on the demonstration. And from that, he was, he was sold, quite, quite literally. Excellent stuff. <laughs> uh, well, before my next question, any questions from you guys? Not yet. How easy was it to get started? Please say easy. Uh, I'll, just say, I'll just say Jess, because Jess is the one that's kind of like helped us all, all through it. Obviously, the conversation we had with your, yourself and sales side, Danny, uh, uh, Craig, from the, the kind of the technical part of it, those conversations, we had frequent, uh, I think we kind of weekly meetings as soon as we got started. Um, it is just such an easy system, and I think I've said it before, the beauty is in the complex, the, making the complex simple. It, if you look at it, rather than asking the hiring manager to go into a spreadsheet, fill out literally columns, which doesn't seem like much, but instigate the thought process yourself. I've got to fill that in, got to fill that in. This is flipping it and saying, answer some questions. And it is as simple as that. And I didn't actually realize it was probably as simple as that. It's just you get a, a notification. Can you answer these questions? Yes, yes, yes. Right, done. And the rest of it, the population of everything just happens. And that's why it's kind of, it's, it is that simple to get it started. Um, obviously, there's the budget conversation. Now, the budget conversation would have been easier if we'd done all those calculations first, because the cost compared to saving 30 million quid, obviously, it doesn't, it's a drop in the ocean. But it, it was very easy to get started, and it, it continues to be easy, because one, it's a simple platform, but we've got great customer success people supporting us as well, making it easy. Person. It's all down to you now, Jess. There you go. A live performance review. A live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what reaction from the business? So have you seen any results? What was the reaction? What, what was the adoption rate? I think the, well, the first one, we are smaller organisations. So obviously, you know, the percentages looks, it's the figure that I'll go off because it looks amazing. You know, we're not a 20,000 person organisation. We have 750 people of which like 125 are managers. I think 70% we ended up on the first cycle of adoption, which was great. Not all of them got it right. That's the other thing. They might have adopted it, but they might not necessarily have done it right. So the amount of roles we had that they put in, I thought, oh, that seems a familiar role. It was a live role. So they were adding live roles because they weren't quite sure about how far in advance. And they were thinking, is it too far in advance? You know, and do I really know? And they, so people just felt a compulsion to complete it, to, com uh, to complete it. But also that got them into the mindset of, all right, now I can have a conversation. And we went back kind of, you've put this in, you want it tomorrow. It's not quite what foresight means, but let's have a conversation. Oh, right, okay, no, but I do have other roles. I wasn't sure how far in advance. So the comms piece, I think, is probably the biggest piece of explaining it. But some people just won't get it straight away. And that's fine. If they've never had anything like this, they won't get it straight away. And I think we've just literally two days ago started our second cycle. I think it's going to be this cycle and probably a third cycle before we get full, more full adoption, but more full understanding of how far in advance um, because their conversations will start to get more about how far in advance, because at the moment they've, they've just been very reactive. I want, I get, and this obviously changing the mentality of the whole, whole managerial population and the organisation as a whole. Yeah, well, it's a journey, isn't it, that you're taking all of your managers on? Exactly. Don't expect to get it right straight away. Uh, cool. Uh, any questions before? Yeah, there we go. Lawrence. Yeah, I think there's, uh, for, uh, the, the difficulty we have, genuinely difficulty we have, is that they're done on different systems now. And this was another thing about in, implementing another system and them understanding. And therefore, what we'd actually introduced at the beginning of the year was another way of requesting budget. So it was quite problematic because rather than setting a budget at the beginning of the year, knowing what you've got, it was a case of if, you, if someone leaves, you can rehire through the normal process, which is a very standard process. If you want someone new to join, You've got to request additional budget because you haven't got, a, we, we went with the flat budget this year, so you need additional budget. And then we come along and say, and on top of that, in three to six months, if you want someone there, then you go through this system. So it was quite difficult, but they're decoupled in a way that they are from a system point of view, but it's more the mentality, which I'll be honest, is still a work in progress. I mean, Danny might have more of a fuller answer from other examples, but we're still a work in pro progress of getting those people. The only other thing is that our demand this year has been lower because we've kind of had a bit of a kind of, 
I was thinking about the Glastonbury Fallow year is probably the way you'd kind of compare it, that we've been going absolutely mad in the field, hiring everyone, and it's like, right, let's just let the field recover for a, a year. So it has been a lot slower this year, so it's allowed us more time to get into the mentality of think differently, and therefore they start to think differently. But I still think we're always going to struggle to get over that a bit because people are just naturally very reactive. But, yeah, that's from our point of view. Well, again, it's, it comes down to it allows you to have that conversation, doesn't it? So it's allowed taking those managers that are particularly not au fait with planning, breaking it down into a simple thing. You're always going to get, like Craig said in uh, the case study, managers putting initial stuff in. They need it. They need it. They need it. Well, actually, you need to have that conversation. Wouldn't you rather have all of that information laid out in front of you so then you can work with those managers so then they won't do it next time, right? Uh, and again the word journey is often overused isn't it but it, it is it's just a we need to start somewhere right get all of that information on the table in one place and then we can work with those managers uh, ongoing Mm -hmm. uh, well, no, that's why the, the so when we talked about those four buckets, so the demand plan, so it, it sounds like that camp of hiring managers it's still worth you doing the flight risk profiling because if they're allowed to hire like for like obviously if they've got a flight risk so it's worth obviously them going through the exercise for them to start to like vocalize who they've got in their team that they're concerned about whether it's a flight risk or an itchy feet or whatever um which is Yeah, retirees, resignations, mat leavers, internal mobility. It's the vast majority is attrition based, isn't it? No. But absolutely, yeah, don't ignore that group of hiring managers. But also going back to your earlier question in terms of it wasting your time, etc. The kind of the methodology and the framework it flushes all that out not wasting your time because that'll all take care of itself between the managers requesting growth and they're not allowed to well actually you don't want to be involved in that that growth request that they might go to their boss etc it gets declined you don't you haven't wasted any time p pipelining or getting involved only when it's approved like via the kind of the process would your team be alerted let's see another hand up yep Yeah, well, so whether it's one or 10, it's mega valuable information because if it's bulk, it allows you to get better at your campaign strategies, where you're spending your money, your ad spend, how many job boards you're going to need. Like everything kind of is, every decision that we see as former TA leaders and within our customers that they need to make is linked to what is their demand, right? Whether it's a number, whether it's granularly split, geographies, whatever, like every single decision that they have to make is linked to having a demand plan, right? If they don't have one, we're in this reactive firefighting hamster wheel, uh, never ending world. Whereas if we can just get all of that information in one place, everything that you'll then be spending your money on, 
whether it's technology, LinkedIn licenses, like how many do you need, how many recruits? So if you could get all of that bulk, you might think, well, actually, there's a business case to hire someone in my team to start recruiting more nursery managers in X location, for example. So we'd say, absolutely, it's massively important. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, so where kind of people leave that do not give any notice at all. So like retail, like the first time a manager knows someone's leaving is when they don't turn up to work that day. Yeah, like in a phone shop, right, for example. So Vodafone, massive customer uh, for us, didn't work in their retail shop because they're like, well, how can we forecast this student not turning up to work tomorrow? Can't. Mm -hmm. So... I'd give an example like retail like that probably wouldn't work. Everything else, it does, absolutely. It makes sense to plan. <laughs> Get that Foresight t-shirt on. But where we have customers that do have that, obviously they focus kind of in their head office or group functions and they fix that and they nail that, which obviously frees up kind of more proactive time to actually start looking at that other stuff as well. Yeah, so typically start to finish, our normal customer onboarding is about three to five weeks. Resource required from our customers is like half an hour of each of those weeks. So we'd be pretty confident you'd take like 90, 95% of what we would consider best practice. That remaining five, 10% is like customization. Like, oh, Danny, we don't call that thing here. Lo loading your uh, libraries in that kind of stuff. You dial into a call once a week, you sign stuff off. There's very, very little work required. I'm hoping that's the case as the matter. <laughs> well, the only, the only thing I would add, I suppose, is something that we haven't done yet is about the integration. Um, so we use it as a standalone system. 
Um, and we thought that any new system, I was told any new system has to go through certain parts of our business. Um, and to be honest, ours was slightly delayed because it sat in a certain part of our business for about two months, then they told us it didn't matter anyway. So <laughs> it, did, it was like GDPR or whatever, they didn't need to sign it off because actually it wasn't integrating with the ATS. But that was just to get things going. So I think over time we want to integrate it with the ATS because obviously the, the information flow. But initially to get it going, if it hadn't have sat as a blocker on our side, it would have been that, that short period of weeks and like we say half an hour a week of just conversations and it's just getting sign off because it's a new it's a new automated tool that's sitting within the business. Everyone worries that all personal data is going to be leaked through it because that's what they worry about. But the reality is if there's no integration, you don't even really need to have those conversations to get it going. But over time, that will be the way that we go because it just makes everything more seamless. Yeah. But yeah. There's two questions and then we'll have oh. no, 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 like we'll go to you first and then Yeah, we get asked that all the time. We integrate to a number of different systems, uh, push the data into several ATSs. Um, but yeah, absolutely, we can do that. Awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> One question. It's not working. I, I um, too, so I thought so. Um, uh, so hold on, I don't want to stand, I'm not wearing the t-shirt, so genuinely I'm not part of the same team, but I, I just think it's that simple. It, I suppose constructive criticism, which is probably not levied at anyone, is that it's, it's that simple, it sometimes seems too simple. And so the business sometimes will go, okay, you're asking us a set of questions, we could do that on a spreadsheet. And the point being that then ha you have to get them, as Danny said, to get them to do it on the spreadsheet, then realise the simplicity of asking the questions is far is far easier because there's going to be a balance of asking our managers some questions, paying for that, doing it on a spreadsheet, not paying for that. But we have found over time, of course, that it's a much simpler system. People buy it a lot more easily because spending a few minutes answering and being on the receiving end of answering questions, which is a lot easier than what do I put in here? How do I do that? Where's the spreadsheet gone? Have you got it saved? Have you got version control? All of that problem. You have to do that. I genuinely believe you have to do that to realise that the simplicity is, is the reason behind it. But yeah, I would say sometimes it might seem too simple and therefore you have to kind of do the justification beyond that. Yeah, it, yeah, because it's otherwise it's just here's an, uh, and the other thing it being another system. But that's more to do with whatever your company yeah. does. If we're trying to marry a lot of systems up and they're not quite aligned, it being another system is slightly the bit that you have to get over. But um, yeah, I think that's... It's kind of the main, the main slight concern, but that's it. We got over that very quickly. <laughs>